So you'll take anything comparable? No, I do want prospects. I want more money. I thought advertising. People often do think advertising. I do have a few vacancies, but I think they're looking for something glossier. You mean how I dress? I mean experience. I could dress different. I dress like this on purpose for where I am now. I have a marketing department here of a knitwear manufacturer. Knitwear. Marketing is near enough advertising. Secretary to the marketing manager. He's 35, married. I've sent him a girl before. She was very happy. Left to have a baby, so you won't want to mention marriage there. He's very fair, I think. Good at his job. You won't have to nurse him along. 110, so that's better than you're doing now. I don't know. I have a fairly small concern here, father and two sons. You'd have more say, potentially, secretarial and reception duties. Only a hundred, but the job's going to grow with the concern, and then you'll be in at the top with new girls coming in underneath you. What is it they do? Lampshades. This would be my first choice for you. There's plenty of different kinds of lampshades. So we'll send you here, shall we, and the knitwear second choice. Are you free to go for an interview any day they call you? I'd like to travel. We don't have any foreign clients. You'd have to go elsewhere. Yes, I know. I don't really... I just mean... Does your fiancé want to travel? I'd like a job where I was here in London with him and everything. But now and then, I expect it's silly. Are there jobs like that? There's personal assistant to a top executive in a multinational. If that's the idea, you need to be planning ahead. Is that where you want to be in ten years? I might not be alive in ten years. Yes, but you will be. You'll have children. I can't think about ten years. You haven't got the speed, anyway. So I'll send you to these two, shall I? You haven't been to any other agency, just so we don't get crossed wires. Now, Janine, I want you to get one of these jobs, all right? If I send you, that means I'm putting myself on the line for you. Your presentation's okay. You look fine. Just be confident and go in there convinced that this is the best job for you and you're the best person for the job. If you don't believe it, they won't believe it. Do you believe it? I think you could make me believe it if you put your mind to it. Yes. All right. If we agree to play roles, to pretend to be confident, what do we do to ourselves? Carol Churchill's play, Top Girls, poses just this question, and the answers are not always positive. The play is, I believe, feminist, yet that doesn't mean it offers only positive images of women. Instead, it looks at real conflicts and tensions faced by women in the 1980s and still faced by women today. Churchill calls her play Top Girls. It's the name of the employment agency in which her central character, Marlene, has just been promoted to managing director. Marlene is a top girl, a modern superwoman. But at what cost? What does one woman's success mean for other women? For the sisters, lovers, friends, daughters of superwomen? Or for younger women, like the job applicant Janine in this opening scene? You mean how I dress? I mean experience. I could dress different. I dress like this on purpose for where I am now. We all dress on purpose for where we are at any given time. Or at least we know that if we do, we'll be perceived in certain ways. This scene shows how women must make deliberate choices about their own presentation. How our sexuality and looks, costume and personal desires can be manipulated to produce a desired effect for advancement in a patriarchal world. We chose Top Girls because it's just dated enough to be treated as history, but still recent enough to feel contemporary. We chose Carol Churchill as the UK's leading socialist feminist playwright, whose work can be seen to be informed by modern ideas about women's rights and representation, though, as we'll see later in the interview with Churchill, she doesn't necessarily embrace these or any other labels for herself or her work. We chose to use the 1991 production of the play, directed by Max Stafford Clark, because it existed on video and therefore could be easily reproduced. The stage premiere of Top Girls was at the Royal Court Theatre in London in August 1982, also directed by Max Stafford Clark. This production transferred to New York and then returned to the Royal Court in February 1983. The play was revived at the same theatre in 1991 with a predominantly new cast. Prior to opening on stage, this 1991 production was recorded for television. Obviously, through the process of recording and editing a performance on video, choices of framing scenes and characters have already been made. 
So we as the audience have less power over our own viewing than we would do in live theater. But however the play is shot, the essential theatricality shines through and the themes of gender and role playing are clearly shown. The office scene we just saw was positioned first in the television production, but is actually seen too in the playtext. Before we watch the play in full, let's look at a few important sequences from what is the opening scene in Churchill's text to introduce the characters, themes, and mood of the play through this complicated scene. Here, Marlene throws a surreal dinner party to celebrate her promotion. A waitress enters. She does not speak and will assume the role of servant to the other guests, who are a collection of women from myth, history, and art. Is it significant that Marlene has no real friends to invite? The first guest to arrive is Isabella Bird, Victorian traveler. She's dressed sensibly for independent travel. I haven't time for a holiday. I'd like to go somewhere exotic like you, but I can't get away. I don't know how you could bear to leave Hawaii. I did. I'd think like to lie in the sun forever, except of course I can't bear sitting still. I sent for my sister Henny to come and join me. I said, Henny, we'll live here forever and help the natives. You can buy two sirloins of beef for what a pound of chops costs in Edinburgh. And Henny wrote back the dear that yes, she would come to Hawaii if I wished. But I said she had far better stay where she was. Henny was suited to life in Tobomori. Poor Henny. Do you have a sister? Yes, in fact. The actor who plays Isabella later plays Marlene's sister, Joyce. This doubling of roles in the play can be read as having thematic importance, though this need not be so. Lady Nijo, Buddhist nun, enters, flowing robes and hair. The women don't seem surprised to see each other. They listen to each other at first. I think a drink anyway. I think a drink anyway. What a week! It was always the men who used to get so drunk. I could be one of the maidens passing the sake. I've had sake. Small hot drink, quite fortifying after a day in the wet. One night, my father proposed three rounds of three cups, which was novel. And then the emperor should have said three rounds of three cups. But he said three rounds of nine cups, so you can imagine. <laughs> When the time came, I did nothing but cry. My sin gowns were badly ripped. But even that morning when he left, I was saying he raped the scarred dining and very heavily employed the trousers. But gradually the women begin to talk over each other. Their voices rise and fall in what seems at first like real dinner conversation. I soon found I was sad if he stayed away. It was depressing, day after day, not knowing when he would come. I never enjoyed taking other women to him. I certainly never saw my father drunk. He was a clergyman. Oh, my father and was I didn't very get religious, and I was Marley. 50. Just before he died, he said to me... It's worth that noting that the technique of overlapping dialogue is an original Churchill hallmark and one which comes into play to much greater effect later in the scene. Each character tends to hear the bit of the story which means something to her and picks it up as a cue for the telling of her own story. So the conversation becomes a game, a verbal way of scoring points. Voices rise and fall, overlap. Stories mix and meander as one woman's tale inspires another. The other characters enter, one by one. Nijo? Gret. Dull Gret, a character from a Bruegel painting, is largely silent in the scene, though the camera often frames her actions. She's a comic character with a serious story to tell. Spend a great deal of time on the sofa. I studied metaphysical poets and hymnology. Oh, you We can order. Next is Pope Joan. Do you know everyone? We were just talking about learning Latin and being clever girls. <laughs> Joan was by way of an infant prodigy. Of course you were. What excited you when you were ten? Because angels are without matter. They are not individuals. Every angel is a species. There you are. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the shared experience of these women is in having and losing babies. Even Joan, the character with the most male authority, having successfully pretended to be a man, offers her own experiences on the subject. Joan's story of her child's birth is comic, almost hysterical. So what happened? I didn't know, of course, that it was near the time. 
It was rogation day. There was always a procession. I was on the horse dressed in my robes and a cross was carried in front of me and all the cardinals were following and all the clergy of Rome and a huge crowd of people. Total folk. <laughs> we set off from St. Peter's to go to St. John's. I had felt a slight pain earlier. I thought it was something I'd eaten and then it came back and came back more often. I thought when this is over I'll go to bed. There were still long gaps when I felt perfectly all right and I didn't want to attract attention to myself and spoil the ceremony. Then I suddenly realised what it must be. I had to last out till I could get home and hide. Then something changed. My breath started to catch. I couldn't plan things properly anymore. We were in a little street that goes between St. Clement's and the Colosseum and I just had to get off the horse and sit down for a moment. Great waves of pressure were going through my body. I heard sounds like a cow lowing. They came out of my mouth. <laughs> Far away I heard people screaming, the Pope is ill, the Pope is dying. And the baby just slid out onto the road. Oh, how embarrassing! The cardinal did it! One of the cardinals said the Antichrist and fell over in a faint. <laughs> <laughs> so what did they do? They weren't best pleased. They took me by the feet and dragged me out of town and stoned me to death. The silence is telling. For once, everyone pays attention. Joan, how horrible. I don't really remember. Now let's pick up on the arrival of the one missing dinner guest, Griselda. Griselda, there you are. I'm sorry, you I'm so late. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> no, no, really, I'm not. Griselda's entrance prompts repetitions of key themes. Appearance, food, self and self-denial, and motherhood, as well as a round of reintroductions. Each character's claim to fame is reviewed. <laughs> this is Joe who was Pope in the ninth century <laughs> and Isabella Byrne, the Victorian traveller <laughs> Lady Nijo from Japan, Empress Concubine and Buddhist nun, 13th century near your own time and Gret, <laughs> who was painted by Bruegel <laughs> Griselda's oh. in Boccaccio oh. and Petra oh. and And Griselda's is to do with her creation in the section of men, and her marriage, and the giving up of her children. Much better to do it straight away. Why did your husband take the child? He said all the people hated me because I was just one of them. And now I had a child, they were restless. So he had to get rid of the child to keep them quiet. But he said he wouldn't snatch her. I had to agree and obey and give her up. So when I was feeding her, a man came in and took her away. I thought he was going to kill her even before he was out of the room. But you let him take her. You didn't struggle. I asked him to give her back so I could kiss her. And I asked him to bury her where no animals could dig her up. Oh, it was Walter's child to do what he liked. But Walter Surely was murder. I had promised. I can't stand this. I'm going for a pee. As the scene draws to a close, the women are becoming drunk. The voices rise. They show more emotion, order more drinks. Show real support when Lady Nijo gets upset, advocating violence. Body language becomes free, and when the atmosphere is completely raucous, Dull Gret finally speaks. This is where I come from. There's a river and a bridge and houses. This place is on fire like when the soldiers come. There's a big devil. And he sat on the roof with a big hole in his ass, and he's scooping stuff out of it with a big ladle. And it's falling down on us and it's money. So a lot of the women stop and get some. But most of us is fighting the devils. And there's lots of little devils our size. And we get them down all right. And we... Her story is crude, rude, fantastic. It couldn't have been uttered before. But now it must be told. And again, the others draw close and listen. A bum with a face and a fish with legs. The scene ends with the women descending into drunken debauchery. At this point, the scene fades into the real but imagined world of two little girls. The waitress reappears as young Kit and speaks. Dolgret reappears as Angie, another relatively inarticulate character. The rest of the play speaks for itself.
Shall I tell you something? We'll go see me now. Now let's watch the full play in performance. Look at each character's costume in use of gestures. Listen to their stories and notice who speaks, who's silent, who listens and who doesn't. Who uses words to impress and who tries to communicate. Also watch for body language. Who catches our attention without words and who needs to speak in order to be heard. Is the play exclusively to do with women? Why is motherhood such an important theme? What messages do you hear? Are they 1980s messages or is the play still relevant today? Janine, aren't you? <laughs> Let's have a look. O's and A's. Six O's. No A's. All those O's. You probably could have got an A. I wanted to Speaks, go to work. not brilliant, not too bad. Well, Janine, what's your present job like? I'm a secretary. Secretary or typist? I did start as a typist, but for the last six months I've been a secretary. Two? To three of them, really. They share me. There's Mr Ashford, he's the office manager, and Mr Philby's Quite a sales small place. A bit small. Friendly? Oh, it's friendly enough. Prospects? I don't think so. That's the trouble. Miss Lewis is secretary to the managing director and she's been there forever. And Mrs Bradford... So you want a job with better prospects? I want to change. So you'll take anything comparable? No, I do want prospects. I want more money. You're getting... 100. It's not bad, you know. You're what, 20? I'm saving to get married. Does that mean you don't want a long-term job, Janine? I might do. Because where do the prospects come in? No kids for a bit. Oh, no, no kids, not yet. So you won't tell them you're getting married? Had I better not? It would probably help. I'm not wearing a ring. We thought we wouldn't spend on a ring. Saves taking it off. I wouldn't take it off. There's no need to mention it when you go for an interview. But what now, do Janine, ask? do you have a feel for any particular kind of company? I thought advertising. People often do think advertising. I do have a few vacancies, but I think they're looking for something glossier. You mean how I dress? I mean experience. I could dress different. I dress like this on purpose for where I am now. I have a marketing department here of a knitwear manufacturer. Knitwear. Marketing is near enough advertising. Secretary to the marketing manager. He's 35, married. I've sent him a girl before. She was very happy. Left to have a baby, so you won't want to mention marriage there. He's very fair, I think. Good at his job. You won't have to nurse him along. 110, so that's better than you're doing now. I don't know. I have a fairly small concern here, father and two sons. You'd have more say, potentially, secretarial and reception duties. Only a hundred, but the job's going to grow with the concern, and then you'll be in at the top with new girls coming in underneath you. What is it they do? Lampshades. This would be Just my first choice for you. There's plenty of different kinds of lampshades. So we'll send you here, shall we, and the knitwear second choice. Are you free to go for an interview any day they call you? I'd like to travel. We don't have any foreign clients. You'd have to go elsewhere. Yes, I know. I don't really... I just mean... Does your fiancé want to travel? I'd like a job where I was here in London with him and everything. But now and then... I expect it's silly. Are there jobs like that? There's personal assistant to a top executive in a multinational. If that's the idea, you need to be planning ahead. Is that where you want to be in ten years? I might not be alive in ten years. Yes, but you will be. You'll have children. I can't think about ten years. You haven't got the speeds, anyway. So I'll send you to these two, shall I? You haven't been to any other agency, just so we don't get crossed wires. Now, Janine. I want you to get one of these jobs, all right? If I send you, that means I'm putting myself on the line for you. Your presentation's okay. You look fine. Just be confident and go in there convinced that this is the best job for you and you're the best person for the job. If you don't believe it, they won't believe it. Do you believe it? I think you couldn't make me believe it if you put your mind to it. Yes. All right. Excellent, yes. Table for sets. One of them's going to be late, but we won't wait. I'd like a bottle of Frascati straight away if you've got one really good. Here we are, Isabella. 
<laughs> Congratulations, my dear. Well, it's a step. It makes for a party. I haven't time for a holiday. I'd like to go somewhere exotic like you, but I can't get away. I don't know how you could bear to leave Hawaii. I did. I'd like to so lie in the sun forever, <laughs> except, of course, I can't bear sitting still. I sent for my sister Henny to come and join me. I said, Henny, we'll live here forever and help the natives. You can buy two sirloins of beef for what a pound of chops cost in Edinburgh. And Henny wrote back the dear that yes, she would come to Hawaii if I wished. But I said she had far better stay where she was. Henny was suited to life in Tobomori. Poor Henny. Do you have a sister? Yes, in fact. Henny was happy. She was good. I did miss its face, my own pet. But I couldn't stay in Scotland. I loathed the constant burke. Ah, oh, Legion! Marine! So excited when my I didn't know you were coming. I think you can't wait for the others. I think a drink anyway. Yeah. What a week! <laughs> it was always the men who used to get so drunk. I'd be one of the maidens passing the sake. I've had sake. Small hot drink, quite fortifying after a day in the wet. One night, my father proposed three rounds of three cups, which was novel. And then the emperor should have said three rounds of three cups. But he said three rounds of nine cups, so you can imagine. <laughs> then the emperor passed his sake cup to my father and said, let the wild goose come to me this spring. Let the what? It's a literary allusion to a 10th century epic. His Majesty was this the Emperor of Japan. I once well, met yes. the Emperor of Morocco. But he wasn't old. Did 29. You know the oh, it's a long story. 29 is an excellent age. Well, I was only 14 at the time, and I knew he meant something, but I didn't know what. He sent me an eight-rayed gown, and I sent it back. So when the time came, I did nothing but cry. My sin gowns were badly ripped. But even that morning, when he left, I had a with a scarlet lining and very heavily embroidered trousers. I already felt different about him. It made me uneasy. No, of course not, Marine. I belonged to him. It was what I was brought up for from a baby. I soon found I was sad if he stayed away. It was depressing, day after day, not knowing when he would come. I never enjoyed taking other women to him. I certainly never saw my father drunk. He was a clergyman. Oh, my father and was I didn't very get married religious until I was man. 50. Just before he died, he said to me, Serve His Majesty, be respectful. If you lose his favor, enter holy orders. But he meant stay in a common and not go wandering around the country. The police were often vagrants, so why not a nun? You think I shouldn't? No, I no, so I think you should. I think you should. What my father wanted. Great. Good. Nijo? Great. Hello, Greg. I know Griselda's going to be late, but should we wait for Joe? I tried to be a clergyman's daughter. Needlework, music, charitable schemes. I had a tumour removed from my spine and spent a great deal of time on the sofa. I studied metaphysical poets and hymnology. Oh, you I thought I enjoyed intellectual I come of a line of eight generations of poets. Father had a poem in the My father and taught me Latin. Latin. Although I was a girl, they didn't really have Latin at my school. school. Suited to manual work, cooking, washing, mending, riding horses. Oh, but I'm sure you're very clever. Books, Egret, a rough life in the open air. I can't say I enjoyed my rough life. What I enjoyed the most was being the emperor's favorite and Did wearing silk servants. Pig. Oh, Joan! Thank God. We can order. Do you know everyone? We were just talking about learning Latin and being clever girls. <laughs> Joan was by way of an infant prodigy. Of course you were. What excited you when you were ten? Because angels are without matter. They are not individuals. Every angel is a species. There you are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I forgot all my Latin. 
But my father was the mainspring of my life, and when he died, I was so grieved. I'll have the chicken, please, and of the soup. Of course you were grieved. My father was saying his prayers, and he dozed off in the sun. So I touched his knee to rouse him. I wonder what will happen, he said. And then he was dead before he'd finished the sentence. What a shock. If he died saying his prayers, he would have gone straight to heaven. Death is the return of all creatures to God. I shouldn't have woken him. Damnation only means ignorance of the truth. I was always attracted by the teachings of John the Scot, though he was inclined to confuse God and the world. me at the time. What I fancy is a rare steak. Gret? I am, of Potatoes. course, a member of the Church of England. I haven't been to church for years. Good work, I like Christmas more than church attendance. Make that two steaks and a lot of potatoes. Rare. But I don't do good work, so I, I have to pass the keys. Well, I tried, but oh dear. Henny did good works. The first half of my life was all a sin, and the second all Ah, oh, what about starters? Soon. Well, your travel's just a penance. I'll have the avocado. Nothing to start Don't you enjoy yourself? Thank you. Yes, but I was very unhappy. And the white members are passed. I think that was a repentance. Well, I wonder. I might have just been homesick. Or angry. I'm not angry. Can no. we have some more bread? Not angry. Don't you get angry? I get angry. But what about? Yes, let's have two more frascati and some more bread, please. I tried to understand Buddhism when I was in Japan, but all this birth and death succeeding each other through eternities just filled me with the most profound melancholy. I do like something more active. You couldn't say I was inactive. I walked every day for 20 years. I don't mean walking. I mean I in the head. I'm about to copy five Mahayana sutras. I don't do think religious beliefs are something are. we have in my common. Head it's no good being active. My heresy. 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 She's calling the Church of England heresy. very attractive heresy. I had never heard of Christianity. Never well, I'm not a Christian, but and I'm we don't all have to believe the same. And you coming to dinner with the Pope, we should keep off religion. I always enjoy a theological argument. But I won't try to convert you. I'm not a missionary. Anyway, I'm a heresy myself. There are some barbaric practices in the East. Barbaric? Amongst the lower classes. I wouldn't know. Well, theology always made my head ache. Oh, good. Some food. Could I have left the court if I wasn't a nun? When my father died, I had only his majesty. So when I fell out of favor, I had nothing. Religion is a kind of nothing. That's what so I, mean I dedicated about what was the rest of me to nothing. Come on, Nijo, have some wine. How would you ever felt like that? Nothing will ever happen again. I am dead already. You all felt like that. But your life was over, but it wasn't. You wish it was over. Hmm. Yes, when I first came to London, I sometimes... And when I got back from America, I did, but only for a few hours, not 20 years. When I was 40, I thought my life was over. Oh, I, I was pitiful. Say I felt it for 20 years. I was not sent on a cruise minute. for my health, and I felt even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Pains in my bones, pins and needles in my hands, swelling behind the ears, and oh, stupidity. Mm -hmm. I shook all over, indefinable terror. And Australia seemed to me a hideous country. The acacia stank like drains. You were I had a sick. photograph taken for Henny, but I said I wouldn't send it. My hair had fallen out, my clothes were crooked, I looked completely insane and suicidal. <laughs> so did I, exactly, dressed as a nun. I, I was wearing to go walking home. shoes for the but first time. I had to go back so ten years. I thought travelling cheered you both up. It did, of course. I'm not a cheerful person, Marine. I just arrived from Australia to the Sandwich Isles. I fell in love with the sea. There were rats in the cabin and ants in the food, but suddenly it was like a new world. I woke up happy every morning, knowing there would be nothing to annoy me. No nervousness, no dressing. <laughs> Don't you like getting dressed? Mm. I adored my clothes. When you I was chosen to give sake to His Majesty's <laughs> brother, the Emperor Kamiyano, on his formal mm. visit, I wore raw silk pleated trousers and a seven-rayed gown in shades of red and two outer garments. That's all yellow, that's so and I did very 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 when I left green home. jacket. You dressed as a boy. Of, of course, see, I was only yeah. twelve. Also, you women weren't allowed alone. in the library. We wanted to study in Athens. No, not alone. I went with my friend. Ah, he and was Lord sixteen, Lord. but I thought I knew more science than he did, and almost as much philosophy. <laughs> well, I always travelled as a lady. And I repudiated strongly any suggestion in the press that I was other than feminine. <laughs> I don't wear trousers in the no office. Great to all I could, but I don't. Appearance. And you got away with it, Joan. I did then. 
Nobody noticed anything. They noticed I was a very clever boy. I and when I shared a bed with my friend, that so was ordinary. Long. Two poor students in a lodging house. I think I forgot I was pretending. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky Mountain Jim, Mr. Nugent, showed me no disrespect. He found it interesting, I think, that I could make scones and also lasso cattle. Indeed, he declared his love for me, which was most distressing. What did he say? What did he you always say? I urged him to give first. up whiskey, but he oh, said it was too fella. late. He had lived alone in the mountains for many years. But did you? Mr. Nugent was a man that any woman might love, but none could marry. I came back to England. Did you write him a poem when you left? Did you never see him again? No, Snow never. on the mountain, my sleeves are wet with tears. In England, no tears, no snow. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I say never. One morning, very early in Switzerland, it was a year later, I had a vision of him as I last saw him in his trapper's clothes with his hair round his face. And that was the day I learnt later oh. he died with a bullet in his brain. Oh, Isabella! He just bowed to me and vanished. When your robber dies. One of my robbers died as my a priest in died. Have we all got dead robbers? I wasn't lovers. a nun. Not I me, was sorry. still at court. But he was a priest. And when he came to me, he dedicated his whole life to her. I quarrelled with him that when the he teachings died, of John the Scot and held that our ignorance of God is the same as his ignorance of himself. He, he only knows what he, he creates die. because he creates everything he knows. But he himself is above being. Do you follow? No, but go on. I couldn't bear to think so that the Neoplatonic ideas would are indivisible really from most God. But I agree with John that the created world is essences derived from ideas which derive from God. As Dennis the Areopagite said, the pseudo Dennis, first we give God a name, then deny it, In then what reconcile the contradiction by looking beyond those terms. Sorry, what? Dennis said what? Well, we disagreed about it. We quarrelled. And the next day he was ill. I was so annoyed with him all the time I was learning him, I kept going over the arguments in my mind. Matter is not a means of knowing the essence, the source of the species is the idea. But then I realised he'd never understand my arguments again. That night he died. <laughs> John the Scot held that the individual disintegrates and I there is no personal immortality. I was <laughs> it was yearning to save him that I felt. So what did you do? First I decided to stay a man, I was used to it. And I wanted to devote my life to learning. Do you know why I went to Rome? Italian men didn't have beards. <laughs> <laughs> the loves of my life were Henny, my own pet, and my dear husband, the doctor, who nursed Henny in her last illness. I knew it would be terrible when Henny died, but I didn't know how terrible. I felt half of myself had gone. How could I go on my travels without that sweet soul waiting at home for my letters? It was Dr. Bishop's devotion to her in her last illness that made me decide to marry him. He and Henny had the same sweet character. I had not. I thought His Majesty had sweet character because when he found out about Ariaki, he was so kind. But really, it was because he no longer cared for me. He even sent me out to a man who had been pursuing me. I did wish he lay marriage. awake on the other of side step. of the screens and listened. I tried very hard to cope with the ordinary drudgery of life. I was ill again with carbuncles on the spine and nervous prostration. I ordered a tricycle. That was my idea of adventure then. <laughs> and John himself fell ill with erysipelas and anemia. I began to love him with my whole heart, but it was too late. He was a skeleton with transparent white hands. I wheeled him on various seafronts in a bath chair and he faded and left me. There was nothing in my life. The doctor said I had gout and there my was heart was much affected. Life. Nothing without the Emperor's favour. 
See, Empress had always been my enemy, Marine. She said I had no right to wear Suri Rayad gowns. There was nothing but in I my was life except my studies. Of my I was obsessed the Prime with Minister. pursuit of the I truth. I taught at the Greek school in Rome, sincere. which St. Augustine had made famous. I was poor, I worked hard, I spoke apparently brilliantly. I was still very young, I was a stranger. Suddenly, I was quite famous. I was everyone's favourite. Huge crowds came to hear me. The day after they made me cardinal, I fell ill and lay two weeks without speaking full of terror and regret but yes, then I got up determined to go good. on I was seized yes, again with a yes, desperate yes, longing for the on. absolute I sat in Tobermory amongst tennis flowers and sewed a complete outfit in Jaeger flannel <laughs> I was well, but I six years die. old I left on foot nobody saw me go for the next 20 years I walked through Japan oh, Leo died <laughs> and I was chosen all right then I would be Pope I would know God I would know everything. I determined to leave my grief behind and set off for Tibet. Magnificent, all of you. We need some more wine, please. Two bottles, I think. Griselda isn't even here yet, and I want to drink a toast to you all. To yourself, surely, Marlene. Yes, Marlene. Yes, well, exactly, Marlene. Marlene. Well, it's not Pope, but it is managing director. And you find oh, oh, the women oh, yes, well, it's all the men. I'm sure it's the beginning of something extraordinary. Well, it's worth a party. To Marlene. 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 To all of us. We've all come a long way to our courage and the way we've changed our lives and our extraordinary achievements. <laughs> Such adventures! We were crossing a mountain pass at 7,000 feet. The cook was all to pieces. The muleteer suffered fever and snow blindness. But even though my spine was agony, I managed very well. Wonderful! Oh. I was here for four months buying an old inn. Nobody to offer a horse to Buddha. I had to live for myself, and I did live. Of course you did. It was far worse returning to Dobermory. I always felt dull when I was stationary. Yes, that's that's exactly why I could never you stay anywhere. The shrine by the beach. Someone shining. On the sea, the goddess had vowed to save all living things. I she would even save the fishes. I, I was full God of hope. would speak to me directly, but of course he knew I was a woman. But nobody else even suspected. In the end, I did take a lover again. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. my chamberlain. There's such a lot of servants when you're pope. The food's very good, and I realised I did know the truth because whatever the pope says, that's true. Oh, <laughs> he the you, and you what was he right? He could keep a secret. So. You did know everything. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed being Pope. I consecrated bishops and let people kiss my feet. I received the King of England when he came to submit to the church. Unfortunately, there were earthquakes, and some village reported it had rained blood. And in oh, France, oh, there was a plague of giant grasshoppers, but I don't think that would have been my fault. I was to make the track steady and ground up their eyes to make the lenses of cameras. And so they were the shouting, camera. child eater, child eater. Some people tried to sell girl babies to Europeans for cameras or stew. <laughs> <laughs> been for the baby, I expect I'd have lived to an old age like Theodora of Alexandria, who lived as a monk. She was accused by a girl. But tell us what happened to your baby. I had child. some babies. And didn't you think of getting rid of it? Wouldn't that be a worse sin than having it? But if the child is about as pope. bad as possible, <laughs> but I wouldn't have known how to get rid of it. Other popes had children, surely. They didn't give birth to them. Well, you were a woman. Exactly. Women, children, and lunatics can't be popes. So the only thing to do was you to had get to rid have it somehow. adopted secretly. But I didn't know what was happening. I thought I was getting fatter, but then I was eating more and sitting about. The life of a pope is quite luxurious. I don't think I'd spoken to a woman since I was 12. The Chamberlain was the one who realised. And by then it was too late. Oh, I didn't want to pay attention. It was easier to do nothing. But you had to plan about having it. You had to say you were ill and go away. That's what I should have done, I suppose. Did you want them to find out? I, too, was often in embarrassing situations. There's no need for a scandal. 
My first child was His Majesty's, which unfortunately died. But my second was Akibono's. I was 17. He was in love with me when I was 13. He was very upset when I had to go to the Emperor. It was very romantic. A lot of poems. Now, His Majesty hadn't been near me for two months, so he thought I was four months pregnant when I was really six. So when I reached the ninth month, I and announced I was seriously was. ill, and Akibono announced he had gone on a religious retreat. He held me round the waist and lifted me up as the baby was born. He cut the cord with a short sword, wrapped the baby in white, and took it away. It was only a girl, but I was sorry to lose it. Then I told the Emperor that the baby had miscarried because of my illness, and there you are. The danger was past. But Nicho, I wasn't used to having a woman's body. So what happened? I, I didn't know, of course, that it was near the time. It was rogation day. There was always a procession. I was on the horse dressed in my robes, and a cross was carried in front of me, and all the cardinals were following, and all the clergy of Rome, and a huge crowd of people. Total pope. <laughs> we set off from St. Peter's to go to St. John's. I had felt a slight pain earlier. I thought it was something I'd eaten, and then it came back, and came back more often. I thought, when this is over, I'll go to bed. There were still long gaps when I felt perfectly all right and I didn't want to attract attention to myself and spoil the ceremony. Then I suddenly realised what it must be. I had to last out till I could get home and hide. Then something changed. My breath started to catch. I couldn't plan things properly anymore. We were in a little street that goes between St. Clement's and the Colosseum, and I just had to get off the horse and sit down for a moment. Great waves of pressure were going through my body. I heard sounds like a cow lowing. They came out of my mouth. <laughs> Far away, I heard people screaming, the Pope is ill, the Pope is dying. And the baby just slid out onto the road. Oh, how embarrassing! The cardinals did it! One of the cardinals said the Antichrist and fell over in a faint. <laughs> <laughs> so what did they do? They weren't best pleased. They took me by the feet and dragged me out of town and stoned me to death. Oh, Joan, how horrible. I don't really remember. And the child died too? Oh, yes, I think so. Yes. I never had any children. I was very fond of horses. I saw my daughter once. She was three years old. She wore a pram red small sleeve coat. Birdie was my favourite. A little Indian bay mare I rode in the Rocky Mountains. Everyone thought I was just a visitor. She was being brought up carefully so she could be sent to the Paris like I was. Legs of iron. And always cheerful. And such a pretty face. If a stranger led her, she reared up like a bronco. I never saw my third child after he was born. The son of Ariaki, the priest. Ariaki held him on his wrap the day he was born and talked to him as if he could understand and cried. My first child was Ariaki's too. Ariaki died before he was born. I didn't want to see anyone. I stayed alone in the hills. It was a boy again, my third son. But oddly enough, I felt nothing for him. How many children did you have, Gret? Turn. Whenever I came back to England, I felt I had so much to atone for. Henny and John were so good. I did no good in my life. I spent years in self-gratification. So I hurled myself into committees. I lectured the Young Women's Christian Association on thrift. I nursed the people of Tobermory in the epidemic of influenza. I talked and talked, explaining how the East was corrupt and vicious. My travels must do good to someone beside myself. I wore myself out with good causes. Oh, God. Why are we all so miserable? Procession never went down that street again. <laughs> <laughs> they rerouted it specially. Yes, they had to go all round to avoid it, and they introduced a pierced chair. <laughs> a pierced chair? Yes, a 
a chair made out of solid marble with a hole in the seat. You're and not. it was in the chapel of the Saviour, and after he was elected, the Pope had to sit in it. Oh, 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 So late. No, no, don't worry. Oh, no, no, really, I'm not hungry. Well, I'll have some pudding. I never eat pudding. Griselda, I hope you're not hungry. <laughs> We're having pudding. I am getting nice and fat. Oh, if everyone is, I don't mind. <laughs> now, who do you know? <laughs> this is Joan, who was Pope in the ninth century. <laughs> And Isabella Byrne, the Victorian traveller. <laughs> Lady Nijo from Japan, Empress Concubine and Buddhist nun, 13th century, near your own time. And Gret, <laughs> who was painted by Bruegel. <laughs> Griselda's in Boccaccio. Oh. And Petra. Oh. And Chaucer. Oh. Because of my extraordinary marriage. I'd like to <laughs> Peter Rose, please, because they're disgusting. Zabaglioni, <laughs> please. Apple pie and what's this? It's Zabaglioni, it's Italian, it's what Jones having, it's delicious. Oh, right. Right. Apples. Yes. Apples. Just <laughs> cheese and biscuits, thank you. <laughs> yes, Griselda's life is like a fairy story, except it starts with marrying the prince. Oh. He's only a marquee, Molly. Well, everyone for miles around is his liege, and he's absolute lord of life and death, and you were the poor but beautiful peasant girl, and he wished you off. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Fifteen. I was brought up in court circles, and it was still a shock. Had you ever seen him before? I'd seen him riding by. We all had. And he'd seen me in the fields with the sheep. He I just rode up while you were minding the sheep and asked you to marry him. No, no, it was on the wedding day. I was waiting outside the door to see the procession. Everyone wanted him to get married, so there'd be an heir to look after us when he died. And at last, he announced a day for the wedding. But nobody knew who the bride was. We thought she must be a foreign princess. We were longing to see her. Then the carriage stopped outside our cottage. But we couldn't see the bride anywhere. And he came in and spoke to my father. And your father told you to serve the prince? My so... father could hardly speak. The Marquis said it wasn't an order. I could say no. But if I said yes, I must always obey him in everything. That's when you should have suspected. But of course the wife must obey her husband. I sought to obey and you. And of course I must course, obey the Marquis. Didn't seem to arise. But why bother Naturally, to mention it at all? To He'd got a thing about married. it, that's why. I'd rather obey the Marquis than a boy from the village. Yes, that's a point. I never obeyed anyone. They all obeyed me. <laughs> and what did you wear? He didn't make you get married in your own clothes. That would be perverse. Oh, he you had meant. ladies with him who undressed me, and they had a white silk dress and jewels for my hair. And at first he seemed perfectly normal. Marlene, you're always so critical of him. But come of on, course he was normal. Zelda, he, was he took kind. your baby. Walter found it hard to believe I loved him. He couldn't believe I would always obey him. He had to prove it. I don't think Walter likes women. I'm sure he loved me, Marlene, all the time. He just had a funny way of showing it. was it. hard for him, too. How do you mean he took away your baby? Was it a boy? No, the first one was a girl. Even so, it's hard when they take it away. Did you see it at all? Oh, yes, she was six weeks old. Much better to do it straight away. Why did your husband take the child? He said all the people hated me because I was just one of them. And now I had a child, they were restless. So he had to get rid of the child to keep them quiet. But he said he wouldn't snatch her. I had to agree and obey and give her up. So when I was feeding her, a man came in and took her away. I thought he was going to kill her even before he was out of the room. But you let him take her. You didn't struggle. I asked him to give her back so I could kiss her. And I asked him to bury her where no animals could dig her up. Oh, it was Walter's child to do what he liked. But Walter Surely was murder. Bonkers. Bonkers. I had promised. I can't stand this. I'm going for a pee. No, I understand. Of course you had to. He was your wife. And were you in favour after that? Oh, yes, we were very happy together. We never spoke about what had happened. I can see you were doing what you thought was your duty. But didn't it make you ill? No, I was very well, thank you. And you had another child? Not for four years, but then I did, yes, a boy. Oh, a boy! Yes, so it he was, please. I kept my son till he was two years old. A peasant's grandson. Made the people angry. Walter explained. Well, surely he wouldn't kill his but children. It true. Walter would never give in to the people. He wanted to see if I loved him enough. He killed his children to was see it if you loved him enough. Was it time or harder? It was always easy, because I always knew I would do what he said.
I hope you didn't have any more children. Oh, no, no more. It was 12 years till he tested me again. So whatever did you do this time? My poor away. John, I never So the people him wanted him to marry someone else to give him an heir, and he got special permission from the Pope. So I said I'd go home to my father. I came with nothing, Better so I went... Better to if your master doesn't I took off want my you. Clothes. He let me keep a slip so he wouldn't be shamed. And I walked home barefoot. My father came out in tears. Everyone was crying except me. At least your father wasn't dead. Well, it I had nobody. a relief to come home. I love to see Henny's sweet face again. Oh, yes, I was perfectly content. And quite soon he sent for me again. I don't think I would have gone. But he told me to come. I had to obey him. He wanted me to help prepare his wedding. He was getting married to a young girl from France. It's and always hard taking him another woman. I didn't like live a woman's them. life. I don't understand it. The girl was 16 and far more beautiful than me. I could see why he loved her. Oh, she God, I can't bear it. I want some coffee. Six coffees, six brandies. They all went into the feast I prepared. And he stayed behind and put his arms around me and kissed me. Oh, I felt half asleep with a shock. And he said, this is your daughter and your son. Hmm? Huh? Yes. What? Oh. oh, I see. You got them back? I did think it was remarkably barbaric to kill them, but you learn not to say anything. Walter's so a monster. Up secretly, what did you I angry? What did you do? Well, I fainted. Then I cried and kissed the children. Everyone was making a fuss of me. What? Did you feel anything for the children? Of course, I loved them. So you forgave him and lived with him? He suffered so much all those years. Henny had the same sweet nature. So they dressed you again? Cloth of gold. I can't forgive anything. You really are exceptional, Griselda. Nobody gave me back my children. I can never be like Henny. I was always so busy in England, a kind of busyness I detested. The very presence of people exhausted my emotional reserves. I could not be like Henny, however I tried. I tried and was as ill as could be. The doctor suggested a steel net to support my head. The weight of my own head was too much for my diseased spine. Don't it cry. is dangerous to put my oneself in depressing circumstances. In so Why should I pain. do it? Yes, but don't cry. They wouldn't let me into the palace when he was dying. I hid in the room with his coffin. Then I couldn't find where I left my shoes. I ran after the funeral procession in bare feet. I couldn't keep up. When I got there, it was over. A few wisps of smoke in the sky, that was all that was left of him. What I want to know is, if I'd still been at court, would I have been allowed to wear for the morning? I'm sure you would. Why do you say that? You don't know anything about it. Would I have been allowed to wear for the morning? How can people live in this dim, pale island and wear our hideous clothes? I cannot and will not live the life of a lady. I'll tell you something that made me angry. I was 18 at the full moon ceremony. They make a specialized gruel and stir it with their sticks and beat their women across the ruins so they'll have sons and not daughters. So the emperor beat us all very hard. What a sword! That's not it, Marine. That's normal. What made us angry? He told his attendants they could beat us too. Well, they had a wonderful time. I'd like another so brandy. Lady Genki and I made a plan. And, and the ladies all hid in his rooms. And Lady Mashimutsu stood guard at the door with a stick. And when His Majesty came in, Genki seized him. And I beat him with a oh. stick. Then he cried out and promised he would never order anyone to hit us again. Afterwards, there was a terrible fuss. The nobles were horrified. We wouldn't even dream of stepping on Your Majesty's shadow. And I had hit him with a stick. <laughs> yes! I hit him with a stick! Non qui avec sari quem pus, you couldn't have followed us, said cream as if the Water hadn't had to. Why should I? Why should I? Because you are. 
it. Oh, it's like oh, you know it's where I come from. There's a river oh. and a bridge and houses. This place is on fire like when the soldiers come. There's a big devil and he's sat on the roof with a big hole in his ass and he's scooping stuff out of it with a big ladle and it's falling down on us and it's money. So a lot of the women stop and get some. But most of us is fighting the devils. There's lots of little devils our size. And we get them down all right and we give them a beating. There's lots of funny creatures round your feet you don't like to look like. Rats and lizards and nasty things. A bum with a face and a fish with legs and faces on things that don't have faces on. But they don't hurt. You, you, you just keep going. Well, we'd had worse, you see. We'd had the Spanish. We'd all had family killed. My big son die on a wheel. Birds eat him. My baby, a soldier runner through with a sword. I'd had enough. I was mad. I ate the bastards. Come out my front door that morning and shout to my neighbours, come out. And I said, come on, we are going where the evil come from and pay the bastards out. And they all came out just as they was in oh, their yeah. oh. baking or washing. And we push down the street and the ground opens up and we go through a mouth into a street just like ours, but in hell. I've got a sword in me hand from somewhere and, and, and a basket and I fill it with gold cups they drink out of down there. Oh, you just keep running on and yeah. fighting. Yeah. You don't yeah. stop yeah. for well, nothing. Oh, we give them well, devil well, such a well, well, Yes! <laughs> I thought I would have a last drunk oh, down the I West River in China. And why not? I just went to Morocco. No, the city was so wild. I had to tell on him. My ship's grain and the gold bucket. Gold bucket, good. <laughs> My horse was a terror to me. A powerful black charger. So off I went to visit the barber sheiks in full blue trousers and great brass spurs. <laughs> I was the only oh. European woman ever to have seen the Emperor of Morocco. Oh, I was 70 years old. What length to go to for a last chance of joy? I knew my return of figure was only temporary, but how marvelous while it lasted! Yeah! <laughs>